Hello there, my name's John Amici. I am an organizational psychologist and a bit of a busybody when it comes to issues of inclusion. The first thing I want to say is thank you for being here. I hope you're okay. Um, one of my day jobs is I work in the NHS. I'm a director of the country's largest hospital trust in Manchester. 23,000 staff and more condolences than I would ever care to give out to my colleagues this year and their families. I know that it's been um, incredibly difficult for all of you and whether you are managing it with ease or whether you're struggling, I hope you know that this won't be forever and I hope you reach out and get the support that you need. On top of that, for many of you, the last 12 months or so is, is this crescendo for black and brown people around race and racism. And while I have to be clear that I do not speak for all black people, I think Michelle Obama speaks for all black people. I speak for some when I say that black and brown people are exhausted by this, exhausted by the revelation of racism for many, exhausted by some of the questions that one would have thought answered years ago about racism. Exhausted by being the source of reform around racism and more. There is more work to do, so we need to gird ourselves ready for this. I was asked by Joy to talk about a number of things and, and I want to start here. Obviously, everybody listening to this knows that race is a social construct. And it's, the author ta Coates says, it's an idea and not a fact. And he's right. The, the race is a biological construct, has no validity to it whatsoever. There are two primary differences between people with darker skin and people with white skin. These are the relative ability to process vitamin D from sunlight and the relative ability to protect folates, it's vitamin D, in, in the skin. That's it. That is the difference between those of us who are darker skinned and those of us who are white. That is it. And yet race and ethnicity has numerous strong associations pertaining to things like increased criminality and drug use, a lack of intelligence, a proclivity for violence and terrorism, and more. And none of these things are real. Part of the work that needs to be done is to help science lead the way. Research has been done on these kind of ridiculous outlandish claims of differences between the races, and they're not real. And we need to keep spreading that message, though that's not going to be enough. Tackling racism means understanding racism and indeed all bias. Racism is learned behavior. I often hear people tell me this um, with, a, with a bit of a smile on their face because they're thinking, they love the phrase that, that if racism is learned, it can be unlearned. But that's not always the case. Some things we learn, we learn so early and they're repeated and embedded and embedded so often that they're there forever. Case in point, I know all the dative prepositions in German. In our fan for undo behindersvision neben. There you go. That's all the dative prepositions in German. I know them all. I learned them when I was 10. Uh, I can assure you I have not lived in Germany, nor do I speak German. I just know them because I learned them early and they were reinforced very often with a ruler by my German teacher. We call this cognitive programming and unfortunately much of the ideas about the differences between men and women, gay people and straight people, certain faiths and others, black and white, Asian and white, etc., are embedded. So it's not just as simple as unlearning them because I couldn't unlearn those dative prepositions in German. It would take a brain injury to get rid of that. Children learn these racial constructs and stereotypes before they are five years old. There's a really famous um, experiment done by Kenneth and Mammy Clark in America. It's called the doll test. And you may have seen some of these videos online. They're quite hard. 
very difficult to watch. So please, you know, just be braced. And if you do look them up on YouTube, this was done back in the 1940s. And children as young as four understood that darker skin meant stupid, ugly, bad. Some of you watching this have fought those creeping ideas in your minds. Some of the uh, new versions of this experiment are not just done with black African-American children, but are done with children of lots of different types, African, Caribbean, mixed heritage, Asian descent, and the results are the same. Because we should all remember this, although people think when we talk of race, we are talking of black, African, Caribbean descendant people. That this experiment showed us that racism, when you look at it in its barest form, has never been about where you're from. It's just been about this. Racism can be deconstructed, but we have to understand that despite the, this flawed scholarship of the CRED report from the government on race, there is a pyramid of racism. The base is that systemic racism, historical and contemporary bias amongst the institutions and across society. And then on top of that base of racism, there's institutional racism. That's bias and prejudice within institutions. And then on top of that, there's the peak, the small peak that pokes up above the water in this iceberg of racism of individual racism, that's the prejudice and bias perpetrated by individuals. I think people want to believe that the only thing we have to worry about is that perpetrated by individuals, but that's the smallest proportion we need to tackle the base, the body of this iceberg of racism. We're going to do this by using, um, I think, science and some of the work of uh, an amazing woman called Professor Susan Mickey who works on behavior change. And she talks about knowledge, capability, and motivation amongst other things as paths to changing people's behavior. And understand this, it is not people's minds we need to change. And I know that this will seem really counterintuitive. I'm a psychologist, I love mindset change, but it's not about that. None of you who are black or brown has been wounded by a racist thought. None of you who are women have been wounded by a sexist or misogynist thought. We are wounded by what people do and say around us. And so when we can control what people do and say, we can change the experience for everybody within the institutions, whether they be schools or workplaces or community centers or hospitals, it doesn't matter. We must increase the knowledge that people have around some of these stereotypes so that they understand and can be vigilant of the ideas that are embedded in the back of their brain, that cognitive programming. We have to give them skills to interact with people who are different than them. Each of us often find it more difficult to interact with people less like us. But you can give people skills and then we've got to motivate people, reward people for the efforts they make and sanction people who exhibit the kind of behaviors that take us back to the dark ages of raw prejudice. Working on institutions is a harder task. It's something that I'm doing with my team at APS. And I know that there are others working on this, but dismantling some of the institutionalized, some of the systemic racism is going to be a challenge that will require multi-agency intervention. It's why it's really pleasing to see that Birmingham has put out its shingle to say it wants to be an anti-racist city. And I think that is so important. I hope that my hometown of Manchester follows suit. I know that you are the choir. You're doing the work already. This fight is a long one. But I think we can help people realize that anti-racism is the only position for anyone in a civilized society to hold. I'm not sure when we'll reach the promised land. I'm 50. I'm not sure I'll be around when we get there. But I hope that you, like me, will play your part nonetheless. <laughs>